Joining us in the Trash Compactor today is James. Hello. John. Hi. And Mickey. Hey. Today we are discussing the first episode of The Book of Boba Fett, the new Disney Plus series. Um, It debuted last week, and we're all pretty big Star Wars fans here. I think all from the same generation. Like, you know, we grew up with it, not during its original theatrical run, but we kind of, you know, discovered it on VHS in the late 80s and early mid 90s like that's sort of so 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 that's interesting because the character of Boba Fett factors in he looms large in that era of fandom I feel like so uh James what were your overall thoughts your uh, your headlines from the first episode of Book of Boba Fett I enjoyed it for the first episode you know it left me um guessing what's going on I, I appreciate the fact that we jumped right into it with after what like how many years of guessing how this character might be alive we they just gave it to us instead of like giving us an episode six or something about the whole thing. Like we got like, okay, this is how we go. And, and now he's back. And I liked the political intrigue. I like that. I really don't know what his motives or goals are uh, aside from what we know from the Mandalorian and the scenes we saw in this episode. So I, I think it's off to a to good start. John, what about you? Overall thoughts from the first episode? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it too. Um, but I was, there were, there were things that I thought maybe they could have done a little bit differently to add more mystery, ironically, for a guy that has like all mystery. <laughs> like, but it's just like, um, it's on Tatooine again, and that kind of has a Mandalorian feel. And it's like a Western thing. I'm like, okay, well, we kind of have that. But like, I, I know they're going to go more into like the underworld and organized crime. And I, I can't wait to see all that stuff. But I was also... I wanted to see more of like um, a transition of personality from what we thought he was, a guy that was like working for the Empire and seemed like a piece of shit who worked for a job at the hut and was always with the bad guys. And then he's like this kind of honorable dude. And I was like, well, maybe in the flashbacks, he'll be kind of shitty. But then when he comes out of the pit, which we'll talk about later, he seems like pretty good right off the bat. And I was like, okay, like, Maybe we were all wrong about Boba Fett. And I don't know, like stuff like that was just like, I guess episodes two, three, four, five, six will go into that, obviously. But I feel like there wasn't something there for me to be like, ah, like that's interesting. I was just like, yeah, it's Boba Fett going about his day, (laughs) like that kind of thing. Like it just seemed kind of matter of fact, like the whole thing just seemed very matter of fact. Yeah, there uh, there are definitely a couple things about his character that I think uh, we'll get into again later. But uh, Mickey, what were your overall impressions from the first episode? Um, I mean, yeah, agree with everyone. I, I think it's really well done, just like the rest of the uh, the previous the, the Mandalorian. I think kind of like going a little bit off of what John said and what you're saying, like being a fan, of like you know, definitely Bubba Fett, like loom large early fanhood in that like kind of that time period. Is you know, I think there's a little bit of. I don't want to say retrocon or whatever, but he's not who I always thought Boba Fett was growing up. So there's a, like a little bit to, like in terms of character wise and story wise to like readjust to. But that doesn't take away anything from what, how well done, they've done it. And the other kind of cool thing I like about it in terms of, like, you know, we kind of talk about these two different the, the, the Mandalorian and Boba Fett. It's not quite a new season. It's kind of different, but similar. Like they're definitely playing with like Western things and like definitely a lot of spaghetti Western. So to me, it's like it kind of feels like, you know, like almost like the difference between like a Sergio Leone movies where you're like, they're kind of same, but they're kind of riffing on the same vibe. And I definitely like appreciated like the vibe and everything mm. too. So yeah, but yeah, I overall enjoyed it. Well, that's an interesting point uh, because it's sort of like when you want to do the Western homage, uh, Tatooine is like the Western homage planet, right? It sort of, it, it sort of yeah. almost feels like, <laughs> it sort of almost feels like it's become that. My overall thoughts, I loved how it, like, I think it, if not the very beginning, like very, very early on, it just starts out with, he's in the Sarlacc and he's being digested and he punches his way out, which it's like right off of Return of the Jedi. Like you see the wreckage of the sail barge and like he, you see that, that, that his fist comes out of the sand and, you know. I had the tales of the bounty hunters on my shelf in the 90s and the the tales from the cantina and all that stuff like there. Are, I don't know how many forms of how Boba Fett made it out of the Sarlacc explanations there have been over the years. But we he's he's gotten out a million times like we knew that he gets out because he's he's a cool character and uh, there's a lot of potential there. So for me, the nostalgia kicked in really hard for me immediately. The fact that it, it picked up right off Return of the Jedi 
uh, we're finally seeing this moment that we all kind of assumed happened off screen. Like we're finally seeing it in live action. It's realized really well on screen. The only thing though, a couple of you mentioned this, it's it's not the character we thought that Boba Fett was. Like you, Mickey, I don't know that it's a retcon because the thing about Boba Fett is we did we never really knew the guy. Like he's not he's not really a character in the original trilogy. And in the prequels, he's demystified it in a certain way, you know, in the fact that we see his father uh without a helmet. And then we see him as a child, and I haven't seen, um, I know that there's an arc with the young uh, uh, Boba Fett in, I think, Clone Wars, which I haven't seen. Um, So the character had already sort of been kind of embroidered upon, and the thing is that it's hard to make your central character likable or at the very least understandable or palatable in some way, and especially on a Disney show, quite frankly. Like, I feel like they are... They kind of did, in my opinion, they had a blank canvas on which to paint. All the stuff that they're like, quote unquote, retconning was never really canon to begin with. Well, you, you said the, the D word with Disney. And I definitely think, you know, there's a lot of question of like, you know, what what the play is, you know, what what the um, decisions being made between whether it's between like the creators and then what the producers are, you know, deciding on. And because it's, it's like, I mean, I could see like a creator being like, I just want him to be, again, bring back to Leon, like, I just want him to be Clint Eastwood in one of those movies and say, never say more than two words per episode. But I mean, is Disney going to allow that? And so I, get, I definitely think there's a question, like, I, it's well done. I really like it. But I mean, I definitely think, you know, we have to, like, I'm, I'm very curious, like, how much this is still a corporate <laughs> product in that sense. And, you know, yeah. And, and what we're missing out on potentially, you know, yeah. type of thing. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, to be fair. I'm of the opinion, I don't think that the producers have to be to be told anything by the suits or whatever, as it were. Like, I think that they understand that this is for a family audience and that's just uh, their natural instinct is to, to do that. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. I think a lot of people talk about Disney with the other uh, sequel movies and stuff like that. And it's like, I, I think Disney has a hand in it, obviously a little bit, but I think they give the artists and filmmakers more freedom than people think. But um, but to my point, what I was going to say was um, uh, talking about Boba Fett's not the character that we thought he was. Totally, I mean, I, I I mean, what was he? He was like a dude in a helmet, but he seemed to have this menace in the old trilogy, and he would like talk shit to Vader's face, and Vader would let him do it, and he even says like no disintegrations and. He's like shooting at the good guys and he's working for Jabba the Hutt, who's like the worst crime lord. So it's like, so he must be nefarious in some degree. So what I was actually kind of hoping for was like, I I like good guy Boba Fett that they established in The Mandalorian. And I like good guy Boba Fett that they're kind of establishing here in this. I was just kind of hoping for that in the flashbacks when it's like, like you said, right out of Return of the Jedi, when it gets out of the Sarlacc pit, I thought he would go through this journey of like uh, hitting rock bottom or atonement or having some sort of like euphoria of like, maybe this isn't the life that I want, but he just kind of comes out of the pit and he's like, Hey kid, I'll free you from your bonds. And he seems all right. He's like, I'll let you be the champion and take the head home. And like, I'm not just going to kill you and leave you alone in the desert. (laughs) Like it's just almost like, it's like, it's like, okay, I guess he's, always been kind of a decent guy. And it's like, it just seemed kind of weird to see that right out of the bat, you know? What I thought that they were doing was, especially with showing the flashback to Attack of the Clones, where you see him as sort of like the origin story. It's like you see that shot of him holding the severed head of his father. The impression that left me with was that he, he sees himself in this child, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point, actually. I never thought about that. And this is also not to say for me that I wanted to see him kill a child. That's not what I'm talking about. It just seemed like they give him a lot of moments to be good. And I was like, I wanted to see some moments of him being kind of crappy before he got good, you know? Well, I'm hoping that they're going to continue with uh, the flashback structure. Oh, it they seems definitely like, have to be. I yeah, seem like so, they're building so, up to... Yeah, so we may still have some of what you're talking about in store. We may be still in for that. James, what do you think? I mean, the era we grew up with Boba Fett, like he he was just a guy in a mask. And this is before we knew who Mandalorians were. Now we mm-hmm. now we know based upon Clone Wars and 
and uh, Rebels and and Mandalorian. So I, I think maybe a product of his character is now we the Mandalorians have a code of some type. Like that's mm. that's a very good point. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I think he could the bad guy. Like uh, not I mean one I would say for Disney because I watched the Marvel shows. Falcon and the Winter, Winter Soldier did some dark things. So they could they could show some dark stuff if they wanted to. I mean they had a scene where Captain America's shield basically was used to decapitate a guy, but. They didn't show that on screen, but they showed the blood on the shield and it was implied. So if they wanted to go Mm -hmm. darker with the show, I think they could. And I think Boba Fett could be the Tony Soprano of of the show where we don't necessarily like the bad. He's a bad guy, but you can empathize with the bad guy. Um, But I I think his his mood might be retconned because now we know more about Mandalorians. And, you know, it would be. I guess it would be obvious that he would he would at some point in his character take up the influence of his father and become part of that code, whatever whatever Mandalorian code or sect or group his family comes from. He would probably adopt that. I think that's an interesting point with the retconning because we have to think about thirty five years ago, whatever he this character seemed like this. Mandalorian comes out, Clone Wars comes out, and it's like okay, now we have all this lore that's established. Now we need to recognize the lore and the dude from 30 years ago. And that within itself is like a tricky thing to do as a writer because it's like, which one are you more faithful to? It's like the Mandalorian is what's out and prescient and new. And then you have what was little as we had in the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi with him. It's like, it's, a, it's almost like a, a minefield and a blessing because it gives them a roadmap of what they can do with the character. But it also, I think, chains them to the ideas of like what's been established. So I don't know. I just think it's an interesting point of like the retcon nature of writing new shows for old characters before lore was even established. Yeah. And by the way, I want to make it very clear that, that I don't, think that retcon is a dirty word. I know that I a lot of times, I, I know a lot of times when it's used, it's sort of used in a derogatory manner. But as someone who has written some, some things, sometimes you get a new idea later and you're like, oh, that's really good. I'm going to do that. And then you, you make it, you make it work, right? Like you fit it in. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because uh, sort of inherent in the concept, the very concept of the book of Boba Fett as a show, the premise is sort of acknowledging how large this character looms in fandom. They're essentially saying he's about to take over the underworld. He's about to be the new job of the hut. He's about to be the lord of the crime world, right? So so that's sort of an outsized role for this man with no name, Sergio Leone, sort of a character. So here's where the real contradiction is. Fans love him so much, but the reason he's so cool, the reason he works is because of how little of him we got, right? Mm-hmm. So, so when you make a show where... The central character is most interesting when you use him sparingly. What do you do with that? That inherently has to change the nature of your impression of the character and the kind of show that you're doing. And I think it does speak to, I wasn't necessarily going to get into this, but something I keep thinking, the slate of Star Wars shows that are coming out There are so many. As a Star Wars fan, I am looking forward to all of them. But the thing that is sort of gnawing at me in the back of my mind is like, is like, should this really exist? Right? Mm. Uh, Because it's it's sort of, you know, the more Star Wars there is, the less special it becomes. And that's not to say that um, these aren't good shows, well written, well produced, well acted, well shot, worthy productions in their own right. But like the fact of the matter is, Star Wars is a commodity, and it always was a commodity. I mean, let's not kid ourselves here. Uh, but now that there's no central, it's not the personal passion project of one man. It's a it's a corporate commodity. There will always, always, always be more Star Wars as long as there is an audience for it. And frankly, there always will be. Uh, like, especially like you say that like, um, Boba Fett would like work so well because he was used so sparingly. And then the also idea of like what I thought about, like, you know, to, to me, like the original three Star Wars movies are just like why they're great is they're 
pastiche and almost in that way where we're saying like that i don't think that's actually a bad word i think that's a good thing that's why they were cool and it was and it was a mashup of pastiches too of like random different things and like you just had this random weird spaghetti western dude in with the same time the movie that had world war ii fighter pilot things going on and stuff like that and now you're just taking that one little bit and like expanding it out into its own thing and that's cool too but it does you know yeah you have to do things different than than the way he is going to inherently be different and that's fine and then to kind of bring that into i think maybe even like a greater view of like not just like talking about the star wars but like the view of tv right now and what you're saying like all these other shows and like do we need like i mean I, you know as i say we're in peak tv now and um and you know whether it's marvel or star wars there's just going to be so many TV, and like they're cool i'm excited but like you know like and it's kind of weird now, like, you know, we're saying like, like when we were, we, we kind of became fans of the same age and now we're the same age too, where for, for me, it's like, if this happened to me when I was 20 or something, 22, I probably have a lot more feelings. I might hate it. I might love it, but I'd be more passionate now. I'm just like, let's chill. It's cool. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll take it or leave it. But 100, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John, you had something to say. Yeah. You were talking about the, the Western nature of the spaghetti Western of it, uh, nature of it. I love that aspect of it. I like the, the callbacks to the music and all that. And it's, very clear that's what they're going with and even when they were doing him originally they were like Clint Eastwood with the with the the spurs and his boots and all that um but there was something I felt like there was almost like a lack of that magic fantasy quality of a galaxy of far far away and um and I and I didn't quite know what it was I was like is it the lighting is it the whatever isn't and then when I was watching it for the second time I realized that they they kind of throw like um, the, the Twi'lek people in particular, they kind of just show up and they're talking with like normal, just like Seinfeld esque sort of delivery dialogue. And they have like perfect Hollywood straight teeth. And I'm like, whatever happened to that weird guy with the pointed teeth, it's like, and like talking to John with the hut with the weird subtitles that he seemed kind of like, and all the aliens in the old movies and even in the prequels and the sequels, and every Star Wars, they always have like accents. Everyone just seemed like they came from like South California. <laughs> and like, yeah. and it just seemed like, you know, when that one guy comes in to tell Boba Fett that my boss isn't going to pay you, he's like, oh, yeah. And uh, by the way, my boss is. A, and I was like, is this like a Key and Peel skit? <laughs> like, it just seems <laughs> like, it was like, this seems so weird. Like, whatever happened to like the, shouldn't he be speaking like an alien language with like the subtitles? And like, shouldn't he just be like, weirder like i wanted more of that weirdness and if you think about boba fett's first entry even in the cartoon of the holiday special he's like it's weird he's like on this dinosaur he's got this big fucking stick which they kind of bring into the mandalorian and like i wanted that fucking kookiness you know i wanted a little bit weirder but that's just taste and as some as somebody who's like 39 approaching 40 i'm like this is fine <laughs> you know, like, this is good. But like, maybe if I was 20, I'm like, no, it's got to be weirder. But like, you know, it's just, I enjoyed it. But, you know. Uh, you know, it's funny. Something that Star Wars, I think, is kind of lost with George Lucas, for better or worse, is, is he had a very quirky, kooky sense of humor. James, you had something to say. Yeah, just to just to go like, if there should be more Star Wars, I think, yes. I'm grateful that it's, he's not another Skywalker. Like he's not Boba Fett Skywalker at this point, so <laughs> or related to Skywalker or anything in the family. Um, so I'm happy because it's a galaxy far, far away, and we can have other stories in that galaxy that do not re- revolve around one family of people who, you know, for good or ill, was the entire saga for this time. So I think we could do that. I, I definitely agree. You know, with with uh, John's point about being weirder, I think I think they should have. It's it's very clean. It's very clean, and I think part yeah, of the dirty. Dirtiness of Star Wars was the fact that they were making it dirty. Like, you know, the behind the scenes of like the cantina is like they were grabbing Matt. Rick Baker was grabbing masks he made for like the last like since he made masks like put on people just because like they had no budget. Like we got to just put this here and I hope it looks good on film. So um, but now everything is like, you know, they have the money to make the best prosthetics and animatronics and CG in the world. So I think you lose some of that. um grit and dirt and stuff of, of like real world real hands touched and made these aliens and gives them that unique alive type of feeling so yeah a yeah. uh, part of me wishes that they like sh- shot this on like super 16 that they stole from like their 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 film school or from like a <laughs> or from like a production company that was going out of business and they stole all the all the film stock uh mickey first of all, i just want to agree with john that that twilight 
Twilight scene really stood out to me. It's kind of weird for exactly the same reasons. But I guess we were just again talking about that kind of like the way it looks and everything. I think is a great time. Should we like talk about the awesome Ray Harryhausen um, kind of thing they did there with that multi arm creature? Oh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Like I mean, that was dude, awesome. Yeah, and I it's cool because was- I mean it's. It's like it seemed yeah. it had to be CG, right? But it almost seemed like they still animated it CG to kind of like recreate that kind of stop motion sense. Yeah, but the design of it just looks so classic, you know? Yeah, like like a claymation sort of thing. No, totally. And I mean, like that's something. I mean, look, it's very clear, uh, not just from watching the show itself, but from all the behind the scenes material. Like the people making this, Favreau, Filoni. I mean, we haven't even mentioned Robert Rodriguez, who directed this, which I mean, by the way, it's so cool to me. It is so cool to me that Robert Rodriguez is directing a show about Boba Fett. If you had told me that in like in like 2001, someday there was going to be a a Boba Fett show directed by Robert Rodriguez. I'd have been like, I, I mean, I don't know what, but that's just. I think we should all take a second and appreciate that that exists and that's what's <laughs> happening. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you recall, but my first impression of the first episode of The Mandalorian was actually very similar to my first impression of this show. The only thing is now we have some expectations of a quality to, uh, quality level, whereas I think before, like I watched The Mandalorian, I mean, even the first couple episodes, and I was like, okay, like I'm 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 getting into this. I didn't know what to expect, but like I I liked that it was episodic. I liked what it was doing. Um, they had showed me enough times that they really understand Star Wars, and they're coming at it from a loving and caring, thoughtful place. From then on, I was like, yeah, like I'm ready to do whatever. I do have to say, though, and this is no knock against anyone involved, but um, similar to how you were talking about the the accents of the uh, the Twi'leks or Twi'leks, I've never known how to pronounce them. But Me neither. Twi'leks, I always heard in my head. I guess I never actually heard it said out loud. Uh, Horatio Sands, the blue alien at the beginning of the first episode of Mandalorian, his first bounty or whatever, like that really stuck out to me at the time. Like he just sounded... Not of that universe. He sounded way too contemporary. Exactly. So, so, but I'm willing to overlook things like that. This is a TV show. It's not. It's not a movie. But the reality is, they are producing these very quickly with less money. Even though, I, I mean, that's not to say that this is a low budget production by any means. But the the nature of the the production is a lot faster, and there's less to be spent. So, so yeah. So you go to central casting for some things, and you don't have the teeth prosthetics for all for all the aliens like i mean that doesn't really uh, bother me that much but i i totally hear you and i agree with you james yeah i guess i, I guess i was gonna i'm gonna be a little controversial and say i i actually that the monster and the sand kind of stuck with me a little bit as being i i love ray harryhausen and i actually like the creature i just didn't see it as the creature for that scene in my head for some reason i like the whole conceit of the scene um i just i don't I just, I just didn't feel, I don't know. I don't know why that creature particularly pulled me out of that scene a little bit for some reason. I thought it could be something different, but I, I like, you know, I obviously love clay. I love how it looked animated and everything. I don't know. It just, I'm just being a little contra nitpicky, I guess, with the scene. <laughs> I, I like, like the monster. I just think the monster could have be, been used elsewhere. And we could add a different monster for the decapitation scene there. Vicky. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I liked it, but I, in, in one way, like my, one of my first thoughts is like, how many different monsters do they have on this planet? This has got to be like, the fifth, sixth different one we've seen in various TV shows. So I kind of agree in in that sense. Well, how many monsters exist on our planet or like how many, how many, how many different kinds of animal life exist on our planet? I think if it was like a crate dragon again, you know, it'd be like, oh, well, that's, I guess like there are only three creatures who live on this planet. But uh, I mean, point taken, John. Uh, It just occurred to me while you were talking about the monster thing. Um, There was always something about it that uh, I loved it, by the way, Uh, but it made me feel really uneasy. And I think the reason why is because I feel like I'm not even sure if maybe Robert Rodriguez, he had to be aware of this because he's a good filmmaker, but like he comes from a world of like rated R pretty gritty stuff. And he also makes like, you know, uh, spy kids or whatever. So when the monster and the choreography is, he's clearly this huge hulking thing. And when he's grabbing their skulls, like, I got so nervous that he was literally going to rip their heads off because in any other Robert Rodriguez movie, it would, (laughs) you know? And then like, and then, so I was like, 
But I knew it wasn't going to happen because this is a kid's show on Disney. But like, so it, I found it in a weird way in the filmmaking sense, really effective just by the way they choreographed it. Because it wasn't just like punching them and stuff. Like, I guess he kind of punches that one uh, alien into the dirt. But like, I was like, ah, like, like part of me just thought like for a half a second, he's going to rip them in half. And like, and so I thought it was a very effective scene. Uh, but the transition into what I was uh, going to say before is that like, there's i've been nitpicking about like oh the accents and this and that but there's actually a lot about the show that i did like you know and that's that was one of it and in uh in particular i still love the uh the more they give me of tomorrow morrison as boba fett and um what's her name uh ming wan na as fennec is that her name am i am i messing that up but um i love it i love their weird chemistry i love their professional nature as like two maybe assassins or bounty hunters like working in league with each other i like the spaghetti western music um yeah i just I, there, there's lots of things i do like about it but i guess this is almost like the the misses seem like apparent to me uh sometimes you know so but it's good i, I think it's more hits than miss you know no, yeah, and I loved like uh, the cover version of the Mos Eisley Cantina music that oh, that yeah. uh, that uh, they played like on the the um, on the guitar, and I love that Max Rebo wasn't on the sail barge, man. Max Rebo's He's alive. Uh, Max Rebo's alive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, again, like this is—I mean, the the fan in me, the nostalgia center of uh, my brain was flooded in that scene. And like, I just loved it. I just loved that. You, you just reminded me there was someone that I, I knew. And um, I think it was Dan Deacon, actually. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Musician, if you're, if, yeah. Uh, I think he used to have this T-shirt. It was like a Star Wars shirt. And I remember loving it because on the back, it was like it was a fake tour shirt for the Max Rebo band. And on the back, it had all these tour dates of fake planets. And yeah. then after the date of tattooing on Jabba's barge, it's, all the other dates said canceled. <laughs> 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 I think that was a shirt. Yeah. No, that was definitely a shirt. Cause hearing you describe yeah. it, I can see it in my head. Uh, yeah. So, so, so not all retcons are bad. I don't think this is a controversial retcon. I nah, don't think I love this it. is a thing. I don't think that this is a thing that anyone, that anyone took issue with. Oh, Max Rebo's alive. <laughs> I thought that was great. Yeah. Five feet from where Boba Fett busted out of the Sarlacc. There's like a burned Max Rebo saying, I'm okay. I survived. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> I mean, it sounds like we all enjoyed it. I don't think anyone yeah. was blown away, but it was more or less what I expected. There was sort of some lore, some lore housekeeping that had to be done. Like they had to explain how how Boba Fett, how he got out of the Sarlacc and how he's now in a position to be sitting on the, I was about to say the Iron Throne, but on Jabba's throne. I thought the rooftop uh, chase was very cool as someone who's not, I'm not here for the action sequences. I never have been, but uh, I. I thought that that was uh, pretty cool to watch. Uh, but yeah, like this uh, to me was was Star Wars comfort food. And I mean that in a very positive way. I don't mean that. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. That said, I am hoping now that it has has done all of that sort of table setting, I'm hoping for some things later in the season, some some developments, some surprises, some unexpected things. Well, yeah, uh, what, what I thought was uh, interesting is like, when they establish that he's going to have a show, it starts with him sitting on the throne and he's in charge. So right. it's like, geez, that's usually the last episode of the season. So like, <laughs> so it's, I find it interesting that they're starting at the end of his journey in a weird sake. So it's like, or more accurately, like that's not the journey we're going to see. Like his journey is going to be something entirely different. And uh, I always like it when I really don't know where a show is going to go. And I have yeah. no idea where the show is going to go from here because he already is in charge. So it's like, okay, like he's going to have power grabs and maybe he'll lose it and get it back or change his mind. But like now I, I can't predict anything. And I, I like that. I like how I, I have no idea <laughs> like what they're going to do and where they're going to take it. I though oh, the only thing I can presume is like, I don't know if Disney or Lucasfilm, whatever, is going to be able to help themselves, but not have some sort of crazy cameo at some point in this show. No, I mean, some I'm sure character is going to pop up, you know, but that's fine, too. I like that, you know. Yeah. No, I think if handled properly and I think they're aware they they have to be 
be be careful and there has to be a good reason yeah. it has to make sense they can't like, bring everyone back every yeah. single time yeah so. when we were talking uh one-on-one off air you mentioned something about you know tatooine again it's sort of oh, like yeah. if it's sort of like if you made a show and everyone just happened to be from juno alaska yep or whatever you said is that what you said yeah, I said Juno, well, well, Alaska in particular. <laughs> yeah, well, but as a counterpoint, what if you made a show that you kept on visiting Juno, Alaska, right? Right. Like a Northern Exposure. Or, or Fargo, like a twi- actually. Or Fargo, right. To me, seeing Tatooine again and having it set on Tatooine, it's not like, oh, how small is this galaxy that it's another mm-hmm. it's another story unfolding on Tatooine. It's like, no, I mean, Tatooine's a whole planet. There are, there yeah. are a million stories in the naked Tatooine, the naked city. I, that, that was not a good uh, uh, thing to try to reference. It didn't work. <laughs> um, but but, but um, my, my only point to that is just that it's a galaxy. And all the other movies, like, it seemed like, a, especially in the original trilogy, Tatooine was just a starting point to go everywhere and then they brought it back with the prequels and i feel like you know how we used to talk about jedi and how like uh back in the original trilogy it seemed like obi-wan kenobi alec guinness was just wearing what desert people wore because uncle owen's wearing the same outfit I, the jawas are almost wearing the same outfit and then when the prequels happen it's like oh that was a jedi uniform i had no idea and so in a similar fashion not quite the same thing when the prequels came out and they brought Anakin's origin to Tatooine and they made Tatooine like this fateful planet, then it became sort of this thing where it's like, all right, well now for episode seven, well, Ray's got to be from a desert planet. And then it's like, nah, it's just like a, let's bring it all back to Tatooine again and again. It's like, I just thought Tatooine was supposed to be like the home that Luke left behind. And now it's like, we keep going back to, and then the Obi-Wan's coming out and I can't wait for that. But that, by the nature of its story, has to mostly take place in Tatooine. It's like, man, I just want like a fucking crazy planet going back to the weirdness. It's like, give me something, something crazy, weird, and magical. You know, when the when the when the when the blue credits hit the screen and you see the stars behind it and the John Williams music comes on, I'm thinking of like all the possibilities of space and the galaxy, but we just keep going back to the same desert planet. We've got you we've know? got a I think there are at least half a dozen more shows that are coming oh, down know, the pike. So, uh, but I just thought uh, so, maybe they could do something different, like yeah, out of the gate. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, the same thing about like making a Boba Fett show right after you just made a show called The Mandalorian. It's kind of yeah, like it's a weird choice. Uh, it's almost like they wanted to make the Boba Fett show. They but but they they had to. He's too famous, too popular, too much lore. So so they have to make The Mandalorian, uh, where you make someone who's just like Boba Fett. But it's not weighed down by all the lore. It seems like that was the show that they wanted to make. And now once you bring in Fett, I mean, then like you want to do that show. But anyway, there's just something I have to bring up because I read this uh, this headline that came across uh, my feed from the SF Gate, which I guess is a San Francisco Marin County uh, publication. The headline is the book of Boba Fett premiere is an abysmal failure on every level. <laughs> The subhead is why the book of Boba Fett was worse than polio. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. And you would think this is a guy who's not a Star Wars fan, but he talks in the article about how he's a lifelong Star Wars fan. He loves Star Wars. He had high hopes for this. Worse than polio? Are you kidding me? Uh, It just it just seems like that is such a an insane reaction to have uh, to something at the very least, at the very least, I understand if, you know, you're like lukewarm to it, but to say that it's worse than like, there are plenty of movies and shows that would be more deserving of, of being described that way. I think this is sort of like the, the problem with uh, a a lot of like, uh, I don't want to say super fandom because that could be very positive too, but sometimes things get very hyperbolic very quickly and so, but but to put things in perspective, the worst movie and piece of art I've ever seen is not worse than polio. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> that's clearly a clickbait thing. So people will go to the website and read his article and it's like, okay, you didn't like it. Like that's just no, the I gist mean, of it. No, I mean, he really hated it. I read the review. Like he, he, he hated it. I mean, you know, you know, Bubba Fett's, uh, you know, he's like a sacred character to some, I mean, to a lot of people and- I'm sure they knew when they were going to bring him back that a percentage of the audience was going to hate no matter hate whatever they did with the character. I'm sure there's there's reasons to hate 
his appearance on the Mandalorian right off the bat. Just he changed his outfit and he's a little heavier than when we saw him in Empire. Like, you know, there's <laughs> like there's nitpicks like and there's people who have probably had 30 years of their own vision of, of Boba Fett or people who love the expanded universe or the Dark Horse comics and they're going to be pissed no matter what. So, you know, but yes, it's never he's not worse than polio. <laughs> it's, a, it's being very hyperbolic there. <laughs> Yeah, you you just maybe re, uh, reminded me of something that I was thinking about when I was watching it the second time, and um, I I I kind of wish that they kept the the grunginess of his um, inherent scars from the Sarlacc pit because I thought that gave him character, and I feel like scars tell stories. And uh, uh, when they made him sleep in his Bagdad tank over the course of the episode, and his scars are basically gone, I was like, oh, like well. It's like it's like they're erasing history of his uh, not history established from the old movies, but just almost like it's just like I don't know. A scar can tell a story, it makes him interesting. It is it's it's, it's it's and it gives him strength, you know, like a badge of honor. I would venture to bet that's a production decision, just so tomorrow. Oh, I totally doesn't agree. Have to have the, I, it it yeah, totally yeah. is, but and, still, and, I was like, ah, just commit, you know, commit to that. Well, well, so, but it also sort of gives you an excuse to have all of these flashbacks because he spends all the time in the back to tank healing. Um, he's mm-hmm. able to. It, it's sort of a natural device to introduce these. These. Uh, it's a good uh, story structure device. Yeah. I totally get that. This is awesome. You found that article and that thing. I haven't seen that, and I just. I also like the idea that we're kind of like a Star Wars podcast, but we'll bring in like the Chap- Trap House style, like pick on some sort of writer who just wrote the most insane thing <laughs> ever. It's just like that's crazy. But <laughs> and the thing is, like, there's nothing like even if you didn't like the show or anything, like there's nothing wrongly made about the show. The, like it has a story structure, it has act like, and, and nothing looks dumb or badly made um, at all. So that's just like, like, yeah, even if you're like, well, I didn't, it wasn't for me that like, there's nothing you can say and like, oh man, that was bad acting or anything in it. No, he even, he even really shits on Tamora Morrison as uh, uh, Boba Fett. He says that he's, he's very, you know, wooden and can emote. And what? like, I was just like, that ship sailed with episode two. i think we actually got through a lot for this uh first episode uh closing thoughts james i i I think it's great i i like the fact that i don't really i don't i didn't have any expectations going into the show so i'm open to wherever it goes and i'm i'm curious as to even why he wants java's throne like there's obviously lots of things that he could do with his his reputation and everything he's been through in the universe. So why he's choosing to go to Tatooine and take over Jabba's palace. I I'm very curious. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what he's doing with this criminal organization. If he's just wants to be a mob boss or if he's trying to mold it into something else that he's going to do something with. Mm, that's a good point. Uh, John closing thoughts on episode one. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I know I've been nitpicky about the weirdness or whatever, the, uh, this and that, but overall, I, I really liked it. And as I said before, uh, I really enjoyed not knowing where it's going to go. It has a lot of surprises left up its sleeve, I feel like, and, um, they're, 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 they're being very cautious with their steps. I could, I could feel, but, um, all in a good way. Like, so there's still, it's, it's a different type of mystery than I thought it was going to be. And that's good. And I also like the little deeper aspects of showing societies that we're not used to, like the underground uh, criminal organizations and like, or even like Tuscan Raider society, you know? I mean, a part of me is wondering if uh, they're going to get into some of the territory that George Lucas's pre uh, sequel outline was supposedly to do more with like the underworld and like the gangsters and how they sort of, uh, were to fill in the uh, the power vacuum left by the Empire. I wonder if this is going to get into anything maybe that George Lucas had in mind, because I know Filoni is involved, so I'm sure he he may know something. But um, uh, Mickey, closing thoughts on episode one. Yeah, two quick thoughts. Um, I agree with everyone. Um, I think I'm going to be very curious, um, and I'm hesitant to see where it goes, because it's good, but I think what made... Mandalorian, like, like magical, I guess, or really special to me was Baby Yoda. I think that was a unique thing they did there with that relationship between the two of them and everything. Hmm. And I feel like yeah. if the if Bubba That's Fett true. doesn't find something similar, I mean, obviously you don't want them to copy it, but just something you, you know, like something unique like that to hang on to. And then 
you know, and we kind of mentioned again how like, yeah, it's fine. It's good. And I'm, I'm very kind of curious, like, like kind of like examine and watch this more, not just in the context of Star Wars, but in, in like TV culture going on right now. And like this idea of peak TV where it's just like, they got to make so much content. They're just putting stuff out and everyone's doing a good job, but like, and, and then maybe, and bring, going back to my original thought of like baby Yoda special, like what's going to make this show, you know, special or stand out, or is this just going to be content, I guess? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm with you. I think, uh, that remains to be seen. I, uh, I mean, again, uh, uh, this to me was Star Wars comfort food, and I mean that in a good way. Um, and I'm hoping we get some more surprises, and it it and it is able to forge a unique identity all its own. What is the Baby Yoda for the Book of Boba Fett? Like, what is the is the equivalent? Um, and we're going to find out in a few short days what uh, what else we have in store. So I want to thank James, John, and Mickey for joining us in the Trash Compactor on this first episode of our Book of Boba Fett reaction show. And we will see you next. I really fucked this ending up. (laughs) 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 See you on the next one. Have a good one, guys.